Hey guys, it's Nick. Welcome to another episode of T-Minus 365. When we think about adopting Microsoft 365 Copilot at scale, security and compliance has to be top of mind. If you think about a prompt from a user to Copilot asking the question there, what it's doing behind the scenes is leveraging Microsoft Graph. It's indexing all the data that they have access to, including their email inbox, their chat messages, their meeting history, as well as any shared repositories where they have access to documents as well, including SharePoint sites, team channels, things like that. And all that information is being fed into the large language model to generate the response back to the user. So when we think about maybe data privacy concerns or access to confidential information, we want to make sure we have protections in place so that users aren't getting inadvertent access to sensitive information they shouldn't have access to to begin with. So within the Copilot model, you want to have these policies in place so it's doing checks and making sure we're validating that access for the user uh, before generating the response back to them as well too, just to make sure that we're not leaking sensitive information to users who should not have access. So within this video, I'm going to be going through a comparison of both the business related security compliance features that are part of that licensing model, as well as the enterprise features as well. So if you can get a clear comparison of what you're getting with both and the protections that you're getting on both sides, as well as the pricing considerations as well too. So it's going to be a demo heavy video. I'm going to go with a high level demo of each of these features. If you haven't already subscribed, definitely subscribe to the channel to see more about Copilot, just Microsoft 365 in general. Otherwise, let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, so getting into it here, we're going to start off with the matrix that I created as well, just to compare the business and the enterprise plans here. I bucketized these under the data protection and access control categories, basically conforming to the CIS controls. Well, this is CIS control three, and this is CIS control six. Not all exhaustive of the features, obviously, that are part of these plans, but I want to narrow in on the co-pilot related protection features that you get, or maybe some of the lifecycle aspects of access controls, because that's really where we get into the data privacy and inadvertent access concerns. I'm not going to read through all of these because I'm going to be demoing them, and you can see more of the high level of what they are. But I think it's interesting that the business premium and E3 from a co-pilot standpoint definitely have very similar features. They're checking the same boxes in this sense from both the data protection and access control standpoint. Again, not at all exhaustive of the features there. And I link in my blog post both this chart just so you can have it or download it, as well as the Microsoft large comparison chart, which is like every feature that you get as part of these licensing, just if you want to take that in consideration. The one call out here is the data classification feature as well that you only get with E5 here. And that to me, as you'll see, is one of the most powerful features because instead of manually having to investigate your repositories, your document libraries, things of that nature, you can actually apply a lot of uh, automated intelligence behind this as well to classify and figure out where sensitive data lives within your organization. And that'll be more, become more clear during the demo. So pretty disparate price point here as well well. So I also wanted to put through this other slide, which includes more of the add-on capabilities, I think, for Microsoft Business. And within here, I've included Microsoft Entre IDP2, as well as the EMS plus E5, because I feel like those are the SKUs in which you get a little bit more capabilities. It definitely, as you can see here, is checking all the boxes as you move up into the access control section. But unfortunately, it's not checking a whole lot of additional boxes on the data protection side. It's really just auto labeling that you get with EMS plus E5. But if you think about combining this with business premium, it is a cheaper price point, obviously, than going up to E5. I still think there's that limitation of not getting data classification though, as well too. The last comparison I want to show you here is combining a add-on that is specifically called information protection and governance, which is $7 a user a month here. So it's a lower price point. But I think it's interesting that you can bolt it on the business premium here because you do get things like the auto labeling capability. Uh, but specifically, you do get this data classification as well, too, which is giving you that a capability of trainable classifiers in the sensitive data, which I'll be showing you here as well, too. So it's a little bit cheaper price point. You still get things like the communication compliance uh, piece to this. And there's even things like content explorer which I'll be showing you that you don't get with that. But it's an interesting one because you do at least get the data classification features and auto labeling that you can extend into retention policies, DOP policies, everything like that. 
If you're on the enterprise plan, I also mentioned this as well too because you can have E3 and then bolt on E5 compliance, which includes all the E5 compliance features for additional $12 a user a month and checks all these boxes. And that combined obviously is $48 versus $57 a month. So just some unique considerations here as well too when we talk about add-ons and bundling licensing. So to better visualize this, let's hop into some demos here so I can kind of briefly showcase all of these features to you so you have a better understanding of what they are. Okay, so starting with the external sharing settings and the sharing settings within SharePoint OneDrive Teams, this is within the SharePoint Admin Center under Policies and Sharing, but effectively here, by default, this is set up to share out with anyone, and all of your SharePoint sites, Teams, everything like that inherit these permissions by default. So you have a lot of customizability in who you can share with, and this, I think, also applies to the internal sharing that you do as well in that Whenever you're generating links, you can dictate who those go to. And this tenant, I've really limited this down to the um, external sharing by domain, so kind of whitelisting domains on demand. It's a little bit more restrictive, but also very much more protective as well too. And then under the file and folder links, this is where you can dictate the settings. And anyone with the link should be something that you try to avoid because you should try to navigate people towards looking at specific people so not just anybody in the world with the link can access certain files or folders. And this is gonna be really important when we're talking about our sharing permissions within the organization and being able to have access to documents really that either we shouldn't have access to or we got inadvertent access to because we found a link somewhere or it's located in a location where Copilot could pull that from because we have holistic access overall. The view permissions should also be on there um, just from the standpoint of getting into further granularity with the permissions as well. But this is all combining into the access controls that we have um, as far as it relates to our sharing settings. And this should help out with data exfiltration externally as well too. The other piece that we have in here that you can see is the active sites. And this, whether or not you're doing automated discovery of sensitive information in your organization or manual collection, this is really, I think, a, a pivot point or a, a kicking off point where you talk about all of the um, actual sites that you have. And this includes all of your team's environments as well, because again, they're backed by the SharePoint site as that document repository. So when we take a look at this, we can click into one of these site names. We can also see the settings of that as well too, whether or not we wanna set it as a public site or a private site. And these first two features that I'm showing you here are available on any plan. And uh, that was in that matrix as well. So you can dictate that. But this is also where you can dictate at a site layer, the individual external file sharing settings as well too. So you could really lock this down to say, maybe this is a confidential site or it's a private site. I also just want to make sure that only people in my organization is the setting here for the external file sharing a setting that I want to have for this particular site. This is also a great way where you can see the members of these particular environments to quickly do an audit against uh, maybe this being a uh, channel or a environment that has sensitive documents within it. And then additionally, you can go straight into the site as well. And this will pull this up and you can look at the document repository here to begin to scan through these documents as well. Now, if you think about that at scale, not very great solution if you have to manually go through all of your sites there, document repositories to try to figure out where sensitive data lives. So this is where you have your data classification feature within the purview environment and compliance portal here. But again, this is only available with E5 licensing. If I click into here um, under classifiers, this is where you get into some more of the automated activity and being able to uh, figure out where sensitive data lives within your organization. So Microsoft by default has a bunch of predefined trainable classifiers within here. I didn't create any of these, but you can leverage them to surface and figure out where sensitive data might live within your organization. A clear example of that is if I click into the finance trainable classifier, it's actually found two document matches based off of this criteria that it's set to train this particular model. And when I go into the matched items, it can show me exactly where they're located and I can click in further to see the actual site location, in this case for SharePoint, and additionally the document that that composes as well. So in this case, I can see that this document that it found that matches this finance trainable classifiers in health research. 
And if I click into that, I can actually see that individual document. I can export it and try to identify, you know, what I would want to do with that in the future. So the classifiers that you have here are really all going to play into further policies that I'm going to show. But this is actual automated evidence collection as far as where sensitive data might exist. And you can actually create new trainable classifiers here. And I'm just going to say copilot test for this as the example here. But effectively what you're doing and what it wants you to do is see this content with like 50 to 500 documents to train a model around what is consistent between these documents, whether that's budget information, certain keywords, things like that. But you can go in and you can actually pick different sites to train the model off of. So if I say, hey, I want you to train a model off of health and research here, I can then go in and actually select folders that are part of that repository. And it'll take some time to go in and, and start to do an investigation around that. But it's trying to find consistencies in those documents. And you can leverage those trainable classifiers to help prevent data exfiltration, things like that, which you'll see here in a few minutes with the other policies that we do create. The other piece of information from a data classification is sensitive info types. So sensitive info types is going to include kind of your holistic high picture for regulatory compliance like PII. Um, you see address information in here, passport numbers, medical account numbers, things like that. And I think behind the scenes it's using a bunch of regex uh, type of activity or logic to figure out where these are at. Um, but in general, there's, there's quite a lot out of the box that you get within here. You could also figure out things like passwords, um, you know, that are being shared as well too within the organization. And just like the trainable classifiers, you can also create your new um, sensitive info types. And when I click on that, it's actually loading up here to start this wizard. Um, but within there, I'm going to say copilot test again, and it needs a description. With the patterns though, um, you can have confidence levels and then you can add a key element which you could use regular expressions, you could use a keyword list, a keyword dictionary to help find this information. And I think this is powerful for SMB because if we're not under regulatory compliance, there may be just a lot of sensitive things that are like really specific to our business that we would want to discover. Um, and this is a way that you can do that. now. You obviously have to start training the model, invest the time to see if it creates false positives or the accuracy of it, because it's never going to be perfect in that sense. But some experimentation is needed along with some prep to identify what is you know, the definition of sensitive information uh, to your organization as well too. So this is kind of a blueprint and you can go in and then explore this content as well too based off those sensitive info types and just figure out where that lives between the different document repositories or in email as well. Next here, I want to get into information protection labels, which is available in Microsoft Business Premium as well as the enterprise related plans. If I'm in this portal here, I have the information protection on the left hand nav. I can go under labels and I can start to create labels within my organization. In previous examples, I've given you, you know, some basic taxonomy that you can develop, which is public, private, confidential, public being anybody can view this information, private being internal only, confidential meaning further scoping down to maybe users or groups within the organization. So you can go ahead and create a label here. Maybe I want this one to be public. You can enter the display name, which might be the exact same thing. Um, you can default to the uh, label priority after you create it. And then you can have a description for users so they better know how to apply the label as well. I'm just going to put test in here for the purposes of this example. You can make this green. I made the confidential one red um, just to kind of color code that as something that's more sensitive uh, to users. And then you can go in and you can apply it to certain scopes. So maybe this is just for files. Maybe this is for files and emails. Maybe it's for files, emails, and meetings. You can dictate that. Um, and then you can do additional protections, right? You want to apply encryption to that. You want to apply some content marketing or some watermarks uh, to that. And then you can scope it out uh, to users. But I'll get into auto labeling here in a second as well, too. Um, and you have a lot of granular capabilities. I'm not going to go through this in depth just for the sake of time with this video. But when you're ready, you can go ahead and you can publish these labels as label policies as well, too. And within there, 
again, you're scoping it to certain users or groups within the organization potentially or everybody. Um, and then you can apply even more granular settings such as making a justification uh, reason to remove or apply a different label. Um, you can say, hey, you must apply this to any document that you save within the organization. So there's a lot of granular ability uh, that you can get into there. After these labels are published, you can go ahead and add the sensitivity label uh, to the document. In this case, I could apply that confidential label and the subsequent policies will drop down as well too, like encrypting that document, applying the watermark, things like that as well. When we take a look at this interaction of sensitivity labels in Microsoft Copilot, this is a user saying, hey, can you get key info from this document? And when it's summarizing those points, it's actually in showing the label that's being applied to that document. And then whenever you're in Word and you're saying, hey, let me draft certain document off of another, and you reference a file in this case, and that particular file has one of our sensitivity labels, does provide you with this symbol to show that it is protected with a sensitivity label. And you can go ahead and then still generate that if you have access to that particular document still with that label being applied. But the other cool part here is after the document is generated through Copilot in the prompt, you can see that it's inheriting that label and it's automatically applying that same label to this document because of the reference to the previous one that had that sensitivity label as well. So there's some checks and balances there and making sure that you have the correct permission set up and extending that when you interact with Copilot. Now, if we pivot back to the portal and go over auto labeling with the sensitivity labels, this is again, something not available with business premium, something available in the enterprise plan, as well as the EMS plus E5 add-on if you want to apply that. But this is where we get into some of our sensitive info definitions and trainable classifiers coming into play with the things that we can do. So basically auto labeling is saying if you detect certain information, go ahead and apply the labels automatically so users don't have to manually apply them as I showed in that example. They have your out of the box regulatory compliance examples like financial information you could say, uh, US financial data, and it's looking for these pieces of information to detect and then apply the sensitivity label that you define as part of this policy. You could also do custom policy here as well too. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that just for the sake of this example. And whenever you're doing this, again, you get to dictate a lot of granular ability about this policy, um, such as the locations you know, that you're going to be pushing this into. Maybe you just wanna do an auto policy in SharePoint sites, something like that. And again, that extends the teams because of those repositories. And then with the rules engine that you have in here, you can create a new rule, but as part of the conditions, you can say the content contains, and then you have your sensitive info types and your trainable classifiers at your disposal here. So if you set those up, maybe they're custom, maybe they're part of the library Microsoft setup, you can additionally start to just granularly apply protections throughout your organization in an automated fashion without having to have that user interaction there as well too. And that's a way just to scale up. And also additionally, when we think about lifecycle, scale out um, in that sense as well too, so that documents are constantly being um, reviewed and updated based off of the sensitive information that they contain or do not contain in that case. Last note on sensitivity labels here, if in the enterprise experience only, you can have the ability to tag all documents within a particular repository or SharePoint site, things like that, with a certain sensitivity label. So in this case, you can go in and you can say library settings um, as part of that, and you can name this, but you could also apply you know, the confidential label to the documents that are gonna be within here. Take note that it, it does mention this will only be applied to newly created or edited files. So it's not gonna retroactively apply that, but as users edit these files or they create new files within this repository, we'll start tagging those as confidential. So you could use a combination of this plus the auto applying of sensitivity labels to start to really put down those protections and really classify your documentation with that taxonomy. Uh, for the other plans that like Business Premium does not include this feature, so you don't have the ability to apply this at a site layer. Shifting into data loss prevention policies here, similar to the auto protection or auto applying of labels within our organization, we have these templates that we can use that incorporate you know, our regulatory compliance information such as our finance data, healthcare, things like that. Um, but we could also do, again, the custom policy as well to really define what information we want to detect uh, within this environment. 
And within here, again, you have a little bit more granular locations in this way from the things that you can protect. One thing to note though, Teams chat messages is really only available from a DLP standpoint in E5, not available within Microsoft uh, Business Premium in that case. And that's important, I'll showcase an example of that. But if you think about inadvertent access to data, some users could be just chatting about sensitive information, maybe, you know, uh, Pam is blurbing, you know, or, or, or releasing information she shouldn't to another employee that they can then surface in Copilot, or accidentally shares a file, or employee has a file within a one on one chat versus that shared repository that uh, Microsoft Copilot could bring up here. But you have a lot of protections against many different environments, including your endpoint, including on prem file repositories. Those can all be incorporated through integrations uh, within here as well, too. But similar, again, to the auto labeling, you can say the content contains, and then you could add, in this case, just sensitive info types um, as well. But you have these granular actions that you can do um, as well too. You can restrict the access to certain groups or users. You can encrypt the content. Um, you know, you could uh, restrict third party apps. You can do quite a lot here uh, from that standpoint. You could also send notifications as well too for the users, um, and in some cases, you may wanna say that we allow overrides, if it's just maybe a policy reminder um, that they could override just to say, hey, we, we think this might contain this information, does it? it maybe a false positive is really where I consider that to be um, something that is generated. There's an alert engine off of this as well too, so as an admin, you can come in and review these policies as well. But let's pivot into seeing more of the end user experience with these policies in place. So in this particular example, I've got a user here, they're sending an external email out. This could also apply to an internal user depending on how you set up the policy. But in this, they're attaching a file here that has sensitive information, in this case, credit card information, that's part of that file as well too. Um, and they're gonna go ahead and just try to send this out uh, from their email inbox. And what you'll notice here is they get this automated response and it rejected that particular email being contained and it shows some messages there as well. The other aspect of this is Teams. And this is again, part of E5, but this is a use case where a user shared a credit card inf uh, or credit card number within Teams and it was blocked from even being sent. Um, the cool part though, is you do have some tool tips that you can apply as well too for the users that they can click on and see more information about what was going on. And they can see, hey, this was blocked because of this credit card number or a debit card number in this use case. Retention policies are next here. They're under the policy section and then under retention. Again, this is a feature that does come with business premium as well as the enterprise plans. Um, and when we're thinking about this, we do wanna apply the concept of data deletion, right? We wanna have a policy for how long you retain data. And the cool part with this is if I say copilot test for the title name here, and we go into the types, we can either say this is adaptive um, and make that dependent on certain uh, attributes like the department. We can go into static here. I just want to show that as part of this example. But one of the new things that they have in here is Teams chats and co-pilot interactions as part of the policy that you can apply from a retention layer. And this is to say, hey, I want to retain these chats for X amount of time. Maybe it's five years, maybe it's custom, maybe it's only a year for you. And you could scope this to different members in your organization. So maybe your executives, you want to say, we want to keep that for a little bit longer versus everybody else. We have a different retention policy for, uh, but you should have this in place to really, again, try to limit the data exfiltration, especially with lateral movement going on, maybe within the company, you want users to be able to reference previous uh, sources of documentation that were in Copilot chat, things of that nature. So you can really customize these settings uh, for how long you retain Copilot interactions. Communication compliance is the next one here. This is again only an E5 feature, but this also plays off of the sensitive info types you've defined as well as the trainable classifiers. Part of this though, they have a default policy that says detect Copilot for Microsoft 365 interactions. You can have specific reviewers that go in and review this trigger uh, that happens. And then you could add the definitions of when should this trigger. If a user's asking about something within Teams, um, Copilot experience that is 
classified as a trainable classifier or sensitive they really shouldn't have access to i want to be able to review that and see if we need to tighten down their access or if they do have access to information they shouldn't have you can see this in this example where we have a list of these interactions and in this particular case a user has access to or is asking questions about a particular project that they really shouldn't in this particular case e-discoveries next here you have basic e-discovery with business premium and then you have more of the premium e-discovery in e5 and effectively here you can go in and you can create a case um, that relates to a legal hold you want to create against data things of that nature so i've created this test with a lot of t's um, in there but as part of the new search you can do a copilot specific investigation within here you could say interactions maybe with SharePoint sites or exchange mailboxes. Again, you can get as granular as you want here as far as the scoping goes. But within the search conditions, you could say, I want the type of search um, within this and you can add or remove options. And they have an option out here for co-pilot interactions as well. So you can basically create a search off of this activity or a legal hold um, within this um, environment as well too to collect all that information going throughout the organization. Now, the additional aspects of this with E5 Premium uh, eDiscovery is that you do get search and delete capabilities as part of Microsoft support documentation that they do have and they reference just that you need the eDiscovery Premium functionality to be able to do that. Just want to call that out as part of the eDiscovery piece as a whole. Lastly, here on the auditing front, they do get this capability in the business plans as well as the enterprise plans. But you can choose some activities here for which you want to search for and audit by. And just like the e-discovery piece there, they did include a copilot activity. And you can say interacted with copilot. And then as you can see, you can granularly scope that to certain users, certain sites, certain files that you want to ensure that there's no interaction with. Maybe it's a really sensitive financial document and you can say who interacted with this within Copilot and maybe figure out that, oh, wow, there's certain people that really shouldn't have access to this. So it's another way that you can do some investigation or post-breach audit, if you will, um, as well too, given you know, both the proactive and reactive nature of how you can leverage this tool. Shifting into the access controls here, you have basic group management no matter what plan you're on with Active Directory and Entre ID. So this is basically saying we can create groups, we can scope this to certain users, and that really should be a basis for how we provide access into SharePoint sites, how we stand up Teams channels, and then the um, actual teams themselves as well as just access controls into documents across the organization overall. So basic um, capabilities with that sense but then if we shift up into a more premium offering, this is including Microsoft Business Premium, Entry DP1, part of the enterprise plans. Um, but when we go to create a new group, we have accessibility to create what's known as a dynamic group within here where we can base the group membership off of certain attributes like their job title and department, things like that. So if I say copilot test for the group name here, you can always select owners to be part of that. I would recommend it just to manage the group holistically. But within here, you have the ability to create custom properties. So we might say the account is equal, kind of enabled, is equal to true, meaning that if we disable a user, we want them removed, we want their access removed from everything that we assign this group to. Maybe that's their SharePoint sites, maybe that's Teams, everything like that. Um, and then we can add other properties here and we can say and or or. For the combination of settings, we can say their job title is equal to finance. Um, and so you'll notice here it's building this rule syntax as part of that. The other cool piece that you can do here is you can validate those rules to say whether or not a person, if you added them um, or you know validate them, would be part of this group. So I'm going to say Adele here for my test. And then it's going to say, nope, she's not going to be added to this group. And based off the verification, she is enabled. She's an active user, but her title here is controller, not finance. So that's a clear depiction there and you can always validate that. But this is a more automated way to perform clear access controls in the sense of adding or removing access to sensitive information or document repositories, things like that. And that constitutes the entire life cycle. So think about employee onboarding, lateral movement, and then obviously removing access when employees offboarded as well too.
Piggybacking off of that, you can get into what's known as access reviews as well, uh, based off of these memberships. And this is something that can automate kind of that review process. Maybe somebody has access into certain repositories, they're part of a group that has access into certain sensitive information, or they're part of a role that is something like a global admin uh, or something like that. So we can create access reviews here. And again, this is not part of business premium. It's on the P2 Entra licensing, which can be bundled in standalone or part of E5 um, as well. But within here, you could say, what do we want to review? Maybe we want to review group and team membership um, within here. And maybe I want to say, um, you know, my health research group has access to really sensitive IP um, within this particular company, and I can dictate what the scope is. So I want to make sure that we don't have um, any users who don't need access anymore uh, to the tenant and review that. You could dictate whether it's a, a multi-stage review and you can select the first stage viewers and all of that. You can select the duration, but this is also where it gets cool in the automated sense, because you could say that we want to have this review on a quarterly basis. You can do this across applications, the group memberships, as well as the highly privileged roles as well too. So the scope of which um, can get really granular as far as all that um, goes as well too. If you go into you know, more of these settings, if I were to fill out this information, we're gonna say group owners, and then we're gonna say group owners for the reviewers, just to skip forward here a little bit. And then we're going to select that for our particular setting there. And then the recurrence we're gonna set as quarterly. You can say never end or end on a specific date um, from that particular setting there. But the other cool part is that you can auto apply the results. So if a user says, no, I don't, I don't need access anymore, they're automatically gonna be removed from that group. And then additionally, if they don't respond, you could say, hey, if the default thing is here is you're gonna remove their access because they didn't respond to us and they'll reach back out maybe if they figure out they, they need access to this or the default could be that we just keep approving that if they didn't give us proper direction. Um, and that way you can do advanced things like requiring justification reasons as well, which is all pretty cool in the sense of not having to manually kind of review all of your groups and, and levels of access over time. We want to make sure we have some self-service and automation capabilities behind that. Shifting into privilege identity management or PIM here, if you think about privilege roles and them interacting with Copilot, they have a lot more permissions, they have a lot more access into information, such as a SharePoint administrator, that they can then prompt into the model and get back a lot more results. So what privilege identity management does is it uses just in time, just enough access to elevate roles within the organization. So you can see here, we have access to all of our privileged roles, including somebody like a global administrator, as well as a SharePoint administrator within the company. And then again, thinking back to the indexing that's going on, we wanna make sure that that user that has elevated privileges isn't going to be abused in the sense of leveraging that to get information that they shouldn't. Or if you think about that user being compromised and being breached, that's also a big problem as well for an attacker leveraging Copilot. So this is allowing you to set up an eligible assignment for users, say in this case, Mario is gonna be eligible to elevate into the SharePoint administrator role um, in this particular case. And you can say maybe they're permanent eligible or they have eligibility for the next year and then it's gonna be stripped. And then you can additionally control the granular settings. So can they activate this role for X amount of time? Do they have to require MFA to elevate into the role? Do they require approval? Things of that nature as well. And then you have a bunch of notification templates that you can send out uh, based off of these as role two. And then Mario can go into the portal here and he can activate that SharePoint role, can dictate the time, provide a justification reason so that they have an audit trail behind that and that really goes and activates that role for just a certain amount of time, thus reducing your attack surface. So I think that's gonna be important for more of our highly privileged roles within the organization. And then we get into the um, access controls related to entitlement management. So within here, you can create kind of a bundle of packages that you can see here, which relate to the aspects of what a user might want to or need access into as it relates to everything within the organization. And so within here, you can dictate the name 
in the description for this, maybe you have a sales organization and you want to say, hey, this is all the groups and teams that you have access into um, when you first start or can access or request access into. And this spans across your applications um, that you might have, your enterprise apps within the company um, as well too. So within the My Apps portal and then your SharePoint sites as well too. So maybe there's some that all employees get. And then in this case, since we have this as part of the sales package, we wanna add the sales specific sites. Cool part also is that you can dictate if they're an owner or a member directly from uh, this interface as well too. And then you can apply this and say, who can request access you know, for this particular access package? And does that require approval? Does it require stages? You have a lot of granularity here to dictate what a user can get access into. So this is getting also, you know, obviously into more of the life cycle aspect of this and being able to manage this at scale when we think about providing access when it's needed and just enough access as well. You could also use this for temporary projects where you say, hey, this, this access package expires. Maybe this is part of a project, but that's all part of the process and it ties into the access reviews that we just saw there as well. Lastly here, if we get into lifecycle workflows, you can think of this as part of the automation capability you can do for certain events such as employee onboarding, offboarding, and lateral movement. So this is gonna give you templates that you can work off of and you can define you know, what these templates are. In this case, we're gonna say this is onboarding template for employees that are located in Washington. You can configure the scope of that and we're modifying that much like you saw in the dynamic rules to showcase that we want these people to be part of the marketing department, part of the Washington region. And then the task that you have is this is where the automation capability comes into play. You can see here we're generating a temporary access pass and sending an email as part of one of the tasks that's already been created. But we do have a library of tasks that we can incorporate here. In this case, you can see that we're gonna add a user to a group within there, or groups within our environment. And then we're also gonna run this custom task extension. In this case, we're interacting or interfacing with a third party to automate the hardware procurement uh, for part of this process as well. Not a lot of SMBs I think will be able to adopt that given the tool set that's available. But regardless, you can then dictate you know, what that user has access to. And in this case, we're also saying we, we've integrated the service now and we can go ahead and procure hardware as part of the automated process that we have here as well too. So getting into a lot of, again, automation behind the access controls that you do provide. And that extends, as you can see here, into offboarding events. So you may wanna run something on demand where an employee just got terminated um, as far as the separation goes. And from there, you basically want to make sure that you strip them from their team channels, you disable their account, everything like that as part of the offboarding process. But that again, extends into the life cycle here where we're ripping out their access from everything that they need. And they're no longer part of those interactions anymore, obviously with Copilot as well too. So that's all the demos I wanted to cover. I hope that gave you a high level of all the features and functionality from a security compliance sense available in business versus enterprise. If you do have any questions, feel free to leave those below. I'll supplement my blog post, like I mentioned, which will include this matrix as well as helpful links to all the content that I covered. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next week.